Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Sunday morning service. I am so glad you're here. I'm glad the snow came and went. It was just here for a moment, and then it was gone, so you made it easy for you to get here. And this is a very, very special day. Our foyer is not normally designed that way, but today is Word of God Sunday. Uh, in the teen class, we're talking about why it's so important to know the Word of God. Job was crying out and saying, I wish I knew what God would say, because when Job lived, not one single page of the Word of God had been written, but God answered his prayers. Job, by the way, was the very first book of the Bible ever written chronologically, and God worked a miracle. 40 books written by different men and authors empowered by the Holy Spirit agreeing with one another. And sometimes people go, well, I don't believe the Bible is true. And I ask this question, who'd write it? Who would write a book that would present man in such a terrible way? Yeah. None of the other religions write anything like that. They write man to look like he's great and getting better. But God tells the truth. And that's why it's different than any book. And then the other question is, and, and Brother Carpenter, not to steal your thunder, he said, why in the world would you not even want to crack open the book that is sold more copies than all the New York bestseller lists combined? And it's still the most popular book in the entire world. So this is kind of an important thing. And so we are giving honor to the word of God, not just because it's a book, but because we have a God who wrote it who wants to communicate with you. So let's stand together as we sing this book. It's full of promises. So Brother Jim will announce the song number. Number 323, Standing on the Promises. Let's all stand together if you can. And sing it out now. Ready on the first. Standing on the promises. this morning with a word of prayer because one of the things I've discovered if without God doing something nothing truly happens it is really easy to be religious but being religious will never get anybody saved ever 
Salvation is a gift of God provided only by the shed work and the entire work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And one of the things that happened in the Great Awakening in 1730 is people realized who God was and who they were not. And when they began to walk in humility and receive the gift of God, it was an astounding transformation that actually founded the nation. And so we are here, we are proud recipients of people who gave their lives so we could have the word in our language. It makes it a very important thing and it makes it a very loving and merciful God who would stop at nothing uh, to make sure that he could speak to you and me. So let's speak to him right now. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we come in the name of of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The name with which you say every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. And the Savior who loved us, the Savior who died for us, not shedding simply the blood of man, but a man who is also God, who existed with you in creation, because the blood of a man could save nobody, but the blood of your Son can save everybody. And so we pray, Lord, that you would do a great drawing work. And Lord, there may be somebody here who is here out of curiosity. And I pray, Lord, that you'd answer their intellectual questions, but I pray that you would take one step farther and answer the questions of the Spirit and that you would do your precious work. Help us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I thought it might be in my name a shining legacy I thought it might be in a goal for success to follow me I thought it might be in a plan to sail across the sea but I didn't find what I really need I found it all I lost everything and made my life to serve a risen king. I found the truth that I'd been searching for. I found it all when I found the I'm letting go of all my ways that I think are best for me. I'm laying down on my ideas of what I think my life should be. I'm leaving everything I am right at Jesus' feet. For it's here I find everything I need.
Well, you all know that today is Brian Brunch, and our greeting hymn should be. Ready? There you Come go. and done. Let's all stand. 183. We'll sing the first verse, and then we'll greet one another. Come back and sing the last. 183. Jesus. just a second I'm going to sing another song nope not yet got to remain standing because here's the thing um, Sundays are a, a time of a warmth and fellowship and encouragement and uh, sometimes for deacons embarrassment and so tomorrow is brother Jim Guru's birthday oh. and so I think he needs the honor of everybody singing to him here we go Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And he's getting an early birthday present. He gets to eat brie and brunch, so that's coming up. Okay, you may be seated. We're going to sing another song there. Okay, that's my hymn book. There you go. <laughs> Happy birthday, Emily.
yesterday. Yay! That's calling out. Okay, we're going to look at number 411. And the only good thing about tomorrow, free breakfast at Denny's. <laughs> 411 now. First of all, we'll start with bulletins. Is there anybody you need old blue? You don't have the blue bulletin, and so you're lost in time. You know it's the month of January, and you don't know anything else, don't know what's going on, want to get one to you, just raise your hand, and we'll hand one out to you. Anybody else here just looking to see if you want one? Uh, very, very good. We'll give one there. Hey, look, he took one. Okay, let the air out of his tires. He's not coming home. <laughs> That's our guest speaker. That is a go ahead and stand and introduce Brother Carpenter. Go ahead. Uh, Ted Carpenter with Aaron Carpenter out of Wildwood Baptist Church in Oshkosh, and I have to accept Wisconsin. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Cheese country, by the way. And uh, he can tell you his experiences as a farm boy, but God called him into the printing of Bibles. And by the way, he's, he's good friends with another man that we support here who also is involved in the printing of Bibles, Couriers for Christ, the home church, uh, the home church of Ken and Tricia Sturtz is also Wildwood Baptist Church. And so anyway, so we already know, you already know you're among friends because we like them, so now we automatically like you. And so that's a wonderful thing. Glad to have each and every one of you here. Want to say hello to those that are visiting with us. And uh, we just want to give you something a little bit special for coming. And so Caleb's going to start at the front. He kind of likes doing that. And so we've got Brother Carpenter. We want to give you one of those. And then Irma right over here. We want to make sure uh, you get one of those. These are, these are coffee coasters. Um, I know they're supposed to be called beverage coasters, but we're a little partial. We call them <laughs> coffee coasters. And, um, and Ariana right there. Ariana, raise your hand. We want to get one to you as well. Good to have you here. And then, Jared, did you ever get one of these? 
Oh, okay, you have one now. Very, very good. And uh, anyway, Ariana, glad to have you here. Uh, Riley's sister, and then there's another little one that's in the nursery. James, um, I'm assuming you did not walk all the way from Alaska. I hope you did not. And anyway, originally from Anchorage, Alaska, glad to have you here today. And then Irma, of course, a friend of Will's. Pray for Will. Uh, Will start. Will is uh, packing his bags. He's on his way to Billings, Montana. And so we are going to miss you, and we certainly are going to be praying for you as well. And uh, let's see here, Desiree, of course, good to have you here as well. Today is Brian Brunch. That's, I think, one of the very first things I need to get out here. If you smell food, that's why. If you're getting hungry, that's why. And right after the morning service, you're all invited to a meal downstairs. Listen, we are Baptists, and we try very, 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 very hard to eat everything. Uh, But we have not succeeded entirely yet. And so every time it's a new goal, uh, we have a saying about this. They talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're just, we practice here is what we do. And so anyway, uh, we are so glad to have each and every one of you here, and you're certainly invited after that. If you look at the placards that are in the foyer, the reason those are there is to give a history on how we received the Bible translated into the English language. And it starts all the way from the Latin Vulgate, even talks about the Gutenberg Bible, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I think is German. Gutenberg, is that one the German one? Okay, very good. And we just go all around the translation process until we arrive to the King James Bible. What a wonderful word of God it is. And this is what we use here as uh, our authority of faith and practice. And you go, uh, why do we use this? Well, one, God promised to preserve his word. Man sometimes likes to pat himself on the back and said, I did something. This is what God did. That's why the King James is not copyrighted so that it can be just given away and uh, not tried to. And this is what uh, Brother Carpenter is dedicated to. And then we have this reality, you go, well, I don't like the these and thous. And I say, well, I don't uh, talk these and thous conversationally. What you may not realize is in 1611, when the Bible was published, nobody had used thee and thou in conversational English for three centuries. Then why is it there? It's for accuracy. I mean, do you really want an inaccurate word of God? It's there for accuracy so that when God is addressing you as an individual or you as a crowd, you can know the difference. This is why he addressed Nicodemus and he said, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, singular, ye must be born again. He's literally saying to Nicodemus, he's saying, I'm saying to you, Nicodemus, that all of you guys need to be born again. Well, that's a little bit of a distinction there. And it's important to have distinctions in the word of God and the 50 cent words are there as well because it's called accuracy. And how important is that we have an accurate and holy preserved word of God. I guarantee you that God did not hiccup when he wrote the word of God for you. And if Jesus says that not even one jot or tittle of my word will pass away, well, Jesus doesn't bring it down to the words. He brings it down to the punctuation points. He says even the punctuation points are preserved. I didn't say that. God said that. So how important it is that we understand God wants to communicate to you. And he wants to communicate to you in a very, very specific way. And the reason is, is because he loves you. It has never been God's intention for people to go to hell. People actually decide themselves to go to hell. They hear the gospel, they wheel on their heel, and they walk away. Yeah, but the reality is, is that salvation is a free gift. Listen, I'm a pastor. I love free stuff. And so that's just the way I was. I was that way as a kid. If there were free chickens at Safeway, I would tell all of you, and that is why I want all of you to know that God loves you and Jesus saves, and he offers that gift to every single one of you. And so Brother Carpenter will be speaking in a few moments. And then tonight, he will be giving his ministry tonight, kind of talking to you about the inner workings of uh, bearing precious seed and how everything, you'll have a chance to ask some questions and answers. Uh, Today, he's going to challenge you from the Word of God. And today, we have a special offering that we do when we have this Sunday once a year. We have a special offering for Bibles, for the printing of Bibles, and every penny of that 
goes toward the printing of Bibles, and this is our word of, word of God offering. And so you go, how do I make sure my offering goes to the printing of Bibles? It's easy. You take whatever you have, you put it in an envelope, and you write Bibles on it, or you write on your check, Bibles. That's exactly what it'll go to. It won't go to put fuel in the shuttle. It won't go to, to buy flowers for the service. It'll go right exactly to where you want it to go and how important it is that it does that. I have one other thing that I want to get into your hands, one per family. And that is, if you look at our theme here, our theme is, Wilt Not Thou Revive Us Again? One of the most major revivals that happened, one per family, Brother Carl. And so what we're doing is one per family. And what it is, it is a message that set on fire the colonies and helped found the United States of America. And it was Pastor Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The revival was happening locally until this sermon was preached. They call it the very first American event in the United States of America a good 35 years before America was even a nation. And so God did a miracle through this message. And so I think it's worth you reading it and saying, what did God use to create a miracle? In that particular church in in that particular church in Connecticut, a very word of God resistant church, when revival broke out, uh, Pastor Edwards was unable to even finish the message because people in the sanctuary were crying out to be saved. He just had to stop the message and have people receive Christ. And that was a work of God. And let me tell you something. There, the God in heaven is not underpowered. He can do it again, but he's going to do it in the hearts of you and me. And I ask, my, I ask you this question, are you ready for revival? Very important question to ask. Uh, so at this time, we're going to have the men come forward again. This is to receive our Sunday morning offering. Uh, if you're a guest here, we're just glad you're a guest here. You know, even just, you can come and you can eat food and, and have a great time with us. Uh, but, of course, the membership of the church, we understand our responsibility in the Word of God toward God, and so we give of our tithes and offerings. And then we take a step farther. We give to missions. We support 42, 43 missionaries. For those of you who know a young lady who went to Indonesia to help with human trafficking, the brand-new shelter opened this week. And so it is open. It's open for business to help rescue ladies from that terrible, terrible, destructive lifestyle and to give them the gospel. And so that is a huge praise uh, that that has taken place. Wanted you to know that. Let's have a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the offering. Brother Glenn, I'm going to ask if you would bless the offering this morning. Father, we bless the offering this morning. Father, we need to see that. Father, your name.
Amen. And go ahead and grab your songbooks. We're going to be leading in a final song before Junior Church is dismissed. I just want to again invite those of you to a special conference that is taking place in Bend, Oregon at Victory Baptist Church. And this is a, a prayer, fasting, and revival conference. I know that sounds intimidating when you first hear it, but they do provide lunch and dinner every day, so it's not entirely what you think. But it is important to know this, is, this conference dovetails into our church theme. And I encourage you, if there's a way possible that you can make it, either Monday or Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, any combination, this is an incredibly important conference. Uh, my wife and I will be down there. A couple of our church family already are committed to go as well, but I sure would love to have you down there as well. So I want you to earnestly pray about that. If you have any questions, I certainly can answer that for you. So at this time, Brother Jim Grew is going to lead us in one more song. All right, number 267, let's all stand before the message. 267, I know whom I have believed. seated it's always fun watching the stampede as uh, they head down to junior church 
And uh, anyway, we certainly pray for uh, those that are down there as they learn the word of God, kind of more at their level. And um, let me make mention again, as I talk about this conference in Bend, it begins one week from Monday. I don't mean Monday like tomorrow. It's one week from Monday that that starts. And, and to those of you who are interested in helping start a new church, we are going down. We are taking a trip. The day is Saturday, March 4th, and we are going to do some outreach work for a new pastor, Pastor Benjamin Cooley, who is starting a brand new church in Redmond, Oregon, called Clearview Baptist Church. And so we want to be a part of that. And so he and I looked at our calendars and we picked uh, March 4th for the date. If you're interested in that, let me know. Probably is going to require us kind of going the night before because uh, here's how Bend works. You can't get there from here. Okay, it's hilarious that you can get to Salem, Oregon on the other side of the mountains faster than you can get to Bend. Don't ask me how that works. If we owned a helicopter, it'd be great. We don't. And so, but anyway, what a wonderful thing that is. And so I had a chance to meet Brother Jim Carpenter in a most amazing way. Uh, my wife and I were smuggled incognito, as many people were, down to uh, Ocean Shores, Washington. By the way, one of the best kept secrets on the Washington coast. Beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful coast, but a beautiful church called Ocean Shores Baptist Church. Pastor Bill and Angie Long. Many of you would remember Pastor Bill Long because he was our keynote speaker when 11 of you graduated at Faith Bible Institute. But we went down there to surprise this man who had been in 21 years of ministry and uh, uh, his church secretary kept the best kept church secret I've ever seen my entire time in the ministry. They gave the church a secret and nobody told for over a year. And um, all of a sudden we all come parading in friends in the ministry. They had no idea, but at that time, uh, my friend, Brother Tim Carpenter, also uh, prayed it in, and we got to meet each other, and, and I knew we had a Word of God Sunday. I thought, this guy has got to come. And so I'll tell you what, he, he moved everything uh, to be able to be here. You know, he pushed schedules. He, you know, Joe Biden called him to help him in his garage to locate a few things, and he said no to him. And, and, uh, but anyway, he came. And he loves the Word of God, and he's here to preach the Word of God for us this morning. Come on up here, brother. Thank you. What time are you going right now? Oh. All right. It is good to be here. Uh, it's a blessing uh, from Wisconsin, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to come here. I, I got in Friday night. I drove across from Portland um, yesterday, and it was snowing. Uh, I stopped at a Walmart to pick up some things, and people were taking pictures of the snow. Um, on Thursday, we had six inches of snow that I got to, to snow blow and get out of the way. It was heavy snow, so snow's not a big deal to me. Uh, but what a, what a blessing to be here. Now, let me, let me challenge you with this. If you can only make one service today, the service you want to be here for is tonight. That's the one you want to be here for. Uh, you're like, wait, I'm already here. I, I know. Uh, it's, a good, it's good to be here. We're going to talk about the Bible a little bit. Tonight we'll share more about the ministry and the video. Looking forward to some questions and answer. Pastor had mentioned Brother Ken Sturtz, the, Ken, the Sturtz family, not Brother Ken Sturtz, but his parents. Their family farm was right next to the Carpenter family farm. Uh, and Brother Ken Sturtz witnessed to my dad when they were both teenagers. Uh, my dad did not get saved at that particular time, uh, but that was one of the key elements. So our family farms, I believe, have been next to each other for about four generations now. Uh, and so uh, we go way back with the Sturtz's good family, uh, not just Ken Sturtz, but his brothers and his family uh, there, uh, a great family to work with. I want to share some things as I introduce myself uh, as, as we look into the Word of God. Um, we'll be looking at several different passages, um, and, and I want to I hopefully make some challenges to you to encourage you about the Word of God. Um, we live in a, a culture and a time where I've never seen the Word of God challenged, and I don't think in the history of our country the authority of the Word of God has been challenged like it has been. And I want to just be one more voice. Your church already does it. Your pastor already does it. That we can rest assured that the Word of God is the Word of God. 
It is the Word of God. And let me just say this as I'm saying these things. I'm from Wisconsin. We refer to ourselves as the land of the frozen chosen. I'm noticing here, and I'm from Wisconsin, excuse me when I say Oregon instead of Oregon. I know, I say it wrong. <laughs> but I notice here that there's a little bit of a coolness towards the gospel. And let me encourage you to keep doing the right thing. Keep serving God, and when we get to heaven, we'll only, that's when we'll know what God really did with our ministries and what we've done as we've served God. So as we, as we look at the Bible, as we look at these things, I want to I wanna just... In introduction, in Ephesians 5, verse 16, it says, Redeeming the time because, because the days are evil. Right? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And my, so my challenge to you today is going to be simply this. What are you doing for God? Now, I know we're going to talk about the Bible. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But what are you doing for God? And, and I want to say this. Don't let Satan get you to believe the lie that I'm not really doing much. I can't really do much. God doesn't want to use me. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing for God, you're doing a lot. You say that again. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing a lot. You say, well, I don't travel like you do, Brother Carpenter. I'm not a pastor of a church. That's okay. In fact, that's, that's a good thing if God doesn't want you there. God needs you where you're at. When I grew up at Wildwood, I mentioned my parents already, they got... They got uh, saved just before they got married, 1974. They got married, 1976, I was born. I got to go to our Christian school. Um, I got to go to church Sunday morning. And, and I say, I got to. These are, these are things that we got to do. I was talking to the young people this morning. There's people all over the world that don't have an opportunity to go to a church that preaches the gospel. There's people all over the world that, that would love to do what we're doing at this very minute. But they cannot for one reason or another. But I had the opportunity to grow up in that situation. I had the opportunity to grow up, I, as, as the pastor mentioned, kind of a farm boy. My grandpa was a farmer. My dad wasn't. But, but uh, people assume that if you're from Wisconsin, you uh, milk cows. You know how to milk cows. I do. Uh, our, our pastor, not our pastor now, our former pastor, he was, a, he was a, um, a farmer. Him and his twin brother got, got the farm from his, his dad, which happened to be the Carpenter family farm is, is to the west of the Sturts farm. The King family farm is to the east of of the uh, Sturtz farm. So Pastor King and their farm, and, and he, he would invite us teenagers over for a rock concert from time to time. We'd go out in the field and we'd pick rocks. That's, that was our rock concert. Uh, so we would do that, baling hay. If you've never been in the hay mow in July, you have not lived. I'm telling you, it's, it's a blessing to be up in a hay mow baling hay. Somebody asked me, what's wrong with America? We don't have enough farmers in America. We don't have enough kids growing up on farms. That's, that's physically one of the problems we have, that physical work ethic. But having that opportunity... But one of the things that people don't understand is, as I've been doing this for 20-some years now, is I was a shy, backwards kid. I, I loved, not that I wasn't able to study and all that, but I, 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 I liked my friends. Working on the farm was fun. I enjoyed, I say fun, it was work, but it was, it was enjoyable. At the end of the day, you were tired, and it was a good tired, and I enjoyed those things. When I was 13 years old, I started helping in our print shop. Now, I had the kind of mom and dad that they didn't ask me if I wanted to do something, they said, we're going to church today, amen. Raise, raise that one just like that. They said, you're going to the church today. At that time, the print shop was actually in the church building, and we opened up our gymnasium, and we had a big scripture collating day. I don't remember exactly what it was. It might have been something with the Couriers for Christ, and we were, we were working on these scriptures. And, and I think it was my mom said to the director at that time, Brother Hoffman, what can Tim do to help? And the first thing that he gave me to do was take a, a stack of boxes and make them and put a piece of tape on the back. And, and if, I were teaching, if I were teaching the junior church, I'd spend some time on this. But my whole ministry started by taking 18 inches of tape and putting it on the back of a box. When God leads you to do something, even if he uses your mom and dad to lead you to do it, do it. Start there. And over time, I, I got done that day with those, and I said to Brother Hoffman, I said, what, what do you want me to do next? Do you know what you do with empty boxes? You, you fill them, right? And so I started filling those boxes with scriptures. Still my favorite job to this day is to fill a box because we can have paper and we can have ink and we can print those things and we can start to put them together. But if I never put them in those boxes and we never ship them, what we actually do on our end doesn't matter until we ship the scriptures to the field. 
that's when it becomes very relevant. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning, but before we get any further, let's take a minute for prayer. Lord, we love you and thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. God, there's a lot of good books out there. I, I certainly don't want to slight them. Uh, Lord, there's some things I can learn uh, about leadership. There's some things I can learn about being a better husband, a better father, and all that out of these books. But Lord, there's a reason for generations now we refer to the Bible as the book. And God, I pray that you would help us to, to put it in its right place today. You've exalted your word above your very name. Guide us and direct us as we read from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to challenge you today with this idea of God using you where you're at through his word. I shared some of the things about my testimony. I want to share some things that are going on in life right now. And, and I want to be careful to do this. Um, God has used a farm boy from not Oshkosh, Wisconsin, but the little city of Amrill, Wisconsin. That's where the Sturzes are from, my pastor King was from, um, our family's from. But God has chosen to use those people, those places, those things. God wants to use us. You understand that? We say, oh, I have to do this. No, no, no. God has chosen to. We get to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We should be thrilled with that idea. So pastor and I were talking, he, he mentioned me uh, having a phone call from Joe Biden and Joe Biden doesn't remember the phone call. I don't remember it either, so it, it works out all right for us. Um, but God has allowed in my schedule this particular month, of course, January 1st, is, it was a Sunday. Um, and, and just a, a quick thing before I say this. My family's very important to me. My wife and I discovered a few years ago that if we start taking off uh, uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and we just take a couple days away and we kind of look back to the past and, and look to the future, uh, that helps my family life. So I, I look at my calendar. The first thing that goes on my calendar for every year is all of our family events. Because what I'm about to tell you is you're like, you have six boys. How do you spend time with them? I don't know, but we figured into the calendar. And we, so we, we put all those events on the calendar. But then as God would have it here in January, the, the second Sunday, the 8th, uh, uh, a pastor in Indiana, so about six hours from us, asked me to come and preach at his church. And they have a, a small print ministry, and he asked me to train him on one of their pieces of equipment on Monday. So I got to preach all day Sunday. I got to train for 12 hours. Uh, I got to train them for 12 hours on Monday uh, and then come back to our shop that Tuesday. That next Sunday, which would be last Sunday, uh, I was out preaching in a church in Wisconsin. Um, because it was close enough, we drove there. They had a service. They had about a two-hour break for lunch, and then we got right back to it, and that was a long day again. And then I'm here today. I fly home tomorrow, and on Wednesday, I start a 15 hour 1500 mile trek down to naples florida for a conference i don't know who's in charge of my schedule but i really need to talk to the guy <laughs> and i say all that number one please pray for us yeah. you folks are about 1800 miles from my house finally being home for for one day and driving 1500 miles from my house for a couple weeks and then coming back and then after that we have a couple missions trips going to puerto rico you go, Puerto Rico? Why are you going to Puerto Rico? Because I'm from Wisconsin, and I'm going to Puerto Rico on missions trips in March. It just makes sense, right? And they don't get snow there. Uh, God, that's a whole other story I don't have time to get into, that God's opened some doors, wonderful doors, to get into Puerto Rico. And then God has opened a door for us to get into Malawi. So I'll be home for less than a week from Puerto Rico and going to Malawi. On our display, you'll see this, this John and Romans. This is in English and Chichewe, the language they speak there in Malawi. These scriptures are arriving presently in Malawi. A whole container load of them uh, are arriving presently. Pray that they can clear through customs and everything uh, simply. Uh, customs is usually the biggest hiccup we have in any of this, um, and that is because sometimes the particular custom official gets a, a, a power hungry, I guess, or doesn't know the rules maybe, um, and just kind of hangs things up. So pray that those get through. But my challenge to you is simply this. God chose to use me from a young age up, God chose to bless me with the family I was in. God chose to, to cho has chosen to bless me with these things, not because of who I am, but because of a, of a family that made the decision to have me in church. Because of a pastor that said, we're going to preach the word of God regardless of how popular it is. Because of a ministry that we have like ours that was started by another man, God has allowed me to step into these various roles. And, and I want to say this again. You don't know the effect that you're having on people around you today. 
I think of a, a guy by the name of Jeff Brayton, a man in our church, never taught me in Sunday school, never taught me in the Christian school. I don't know that he ever helped me memorize a, a, a single word out of, God's, out of God's word. But he was a faithful man to church. Now, he's passed away, but I look up to him, I respect him, I'm thankful for a man like him that just taught me this is how, this is how a man acts. Took care of his family, went to work every day, was faithful, faithful, faithful. Every single one of us in this room can be faithful to God. Wherever that is in our lives, we can be faithful to God. I want to have you look at a, a passage of Scripture as, as I ask you to uh, pray for our ministry, as I ask you to, to consider serving God. One of the things that happens sometimes is you get tired in the ministry. You get tired serving God. It seems like it's an uphill battle all the time. It seems like in Satan wants to bog us down. I just told you about my schedule. What I didn't tell you about my schedule is the days off that I get in there. So we're going down to, to Florida, and I'm going to be in a conference, and I'm going to be preaching Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I don't have another meeting until Sunday. And the church has somebody that, that they know that has a winter house down in Florida on Marco Island, and we're going to stay in that for a week. You know what I'm doing? Not this Thursday and Friday, because I'm going to be driving. You know what I'm doing the next Thursday and Friday? Nothing. I'm doing nothing. Now, that's not completely true. I have my family with me. But God opens those opportunities. When you serve God, I have got to be some of the choicest people in the world doing what I do. I, I have, uh, on Friday, before I left to come here, we had 20 people from another church in, in Wisconsin come and work in the print shop. When I woke up that morning, I had emails from Malawi, Africa, with a missionary I've never met, for a campaign for another missionary that I do know, I, had, I was in contact with my friends in Puerto Rico preparing these things. I have uh, uh, another guy in our, our ministry is on his way to Arizona. I've been able to reach out to all of these different places by simply doing what God has for me. You'd be amazed what God has planned for you. He wants to use you. Isn't it amazing that God wants to use you and you can actually tell God no? The rest of creation cannot do that, by the way. It does exactly what God tells it to do. What he wants is, and here's the thing that sometimes we get wrapped up in. We go, I, that just seems like a lot of work. That seems like a lot of heartache. That seems heavy. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This week, while I was working in the print shop, a young man came in our shop, 30 years old. When he was, when he was a young, young man, when he was a child, he went to our church, and at 10, his family moved away, and I hadn't seen him for 20 years. I didn't know the guy was even alive, to be frank. And he had gotten into the world. And when he shared his testimony, he, everything the world had to offer, he'd gotten into it bad. And six months ago, he actually got saved. And what a blessing that was. Some kid that I thought I had grown up in a Christian family, he did, but he didn't really get saved. Now, let me say this. I, I share this with the young people. I thought I got saved when I was five and didn't genuinely get saved until I was 11. Don't ever be afraid to talk to your pastor or somebody about that. When I was five or six, seven, those six years, I struggled with my salvation. And I was afraid, what are my parents going to say if I say I, I didn't really get saved? What are my friends going to say? What's my pastor, my, my school principal, what are they going to say? Every one of them was thrilled. Every one of them was thrilled I got taken care of. Yeah. And if somebody had a problem with that, they weren't right with God. And that should not, hesit that should not keep us. So this young man gets saved, but he's sharing his testimony and the stuff he has. Can I say, can I say the burden of sin and the burden of the world? That's a heavy load to bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the heavy load. Being a Christian, separating ourselves from the world, serving God, having things intact. Sure, it's a burden. I'm not going to say it's not. I'm not going to say there's not some weight to carry. But we have Jesus to help us. We have the word of God to come back to. We actually, we actually have the answers. We actually have the answers. I want to challenge you as, as we move on with these thoughts. I want to challenge you with some thoughts. We have been conditioned, if I can use that term, 
to believe that we are the ones that are having the hardest time. We are the ones that are struggling. And that keeps us from serving God the way we should. The United States of America makes up 4% of the world's population. 4% of the world's population. It makes up 41% of the wealth. I don't know you. I, I know your pastor a little bit. But I can say this without blinking, without blushing. Me, you, whoever, are some of the richest people to ever live in the history of the world. You go, wow, you haven't seen my bank account. You haven't seen my house. You haven't seen my car. I don't care. I don't need to. The fact that you, that you have somewhere to sleep at night, the fact that you have a car, the fact that you have a bank account, the fact that you have a job. My, my brother-in-law is a missionary to Malawi where we're shipping these scriptures to. And, and he's, he's over there right now. They had a guy come to church that hadn't eaten in five days. I've shared this with the young people. They hadn't eaten in five days. Passed out in church. Listen, I don't know how long it's been since you've eaten, but I know there's a whole bunch of food downstairs. And if you're getting nervous about how long I want to preach, don't worry. It is almost 2 o'clock back home. I'm past lunchtime. My body's asking me what I'm doing here. It's nap time already. But I'm saying we're supernaturally blessed with what we have. The fact that I get on an airplane on Friday, fly over here, get a rental car, come over here, stay in a hotel, tomorrow I'm going to fly back out and then drive a car down to Florida. The fact that we can do those things, that God has given us those things, that we can serve him. We can use these instruments. In my case, I know how to run printing equipment and how to print Bibles. I have a farming background. You know what that means? I like to work with my hands. People come by the shop after I've been to their church, and, and they'll say, hey, we had a guy representing, representing your ministry there, and, and so on and so forth. Well, that was me. Say, no, no, he was wearing a suit and tie. And I go, yeah. <laughs> That's only on Sundays. I don't, I don't dress like that in the print shop, I promise you. I love working with my hands. God gave me that desire to see those things. But God has given us the ability to do these things, the ability to reach the lost with the Word of God. God has blessed us beyond means. And he wants to use you. And how does he want to use you? He wants to do it by redeeming the time, using your time to his glory. I heard this some time ago, but... Somebody, I heard a preacher say, we need to stop praying for victory in our lives. And we need to start claiming the victory. We have the victory through Christ. We have the victory through Christ. You might believe that God created the world. You might believe in the virgin birth. You might believe that Christ is coming back soon. But why can't we believe that God wants to use us? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The reason that I can do what I can do, yes, I'm in good health, and I praise God for my health. But the reason I can do what I do is because I believe this is what God has for me. And I believe I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, I've noticed as I'm starting to get a little older that I've got to plan some of those days off occasionally and give the body a little rest. But I believe that God wants to use us. God wants to use his word. God wants to challenge us. To serve him. So as we, as we go through these passages, Psalm 126, we'll, we'll read that as our, our really our, our text, and this is where we get the name of our ministry from. But I want you to remember in uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, the, the, it says this, that the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. So it's the parable of the sower. In Psalm 126 and verse uh, 5, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The precious seed of God's word. The precious seed. Now, now we, we've, we've used that, and we've used that kind of as, a, as a, a title that we use for our ministry and kind of a name so people know who we are and what we're doing. But the precious seed is God's word. We say, well, what's the, what's the name of your ministry? Bearing precious seed? Yeah, it is. But that's so you know what we're, what we're doing. We're carrying the precious seed. The, 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 <laughs> I'll be done quick. Again, I'm hungry. Uh, you need to understand what I'm saying. The, 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 the points, bearing precious seed, obviously in the title, is simple, simply this. Bearing precious seed. Bearing, every one of us can be bearing a precious seed. Bearing, according to the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, is supporting, bearing, enduring, upholding, sustaining, maintaining, uh, uh, substituting. It is, a, it is the responsibility of us as local churches to do that. 
pastor said, hey, he taught, we, when we talk, hey, this is, this, is, this is Bible week. This is when we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get behind the Bible. As he mentioned, giving a gift to, to our ministry, not to feed my family, not to pay my bills, not to, to print Bibles. That is exactly how our ministry worked. Hey, do you think paper has gotten more expensive or less expensive in the last couple of years? More expensive. Now, i got a story to tell you tonight about that, but I, so I can share that. But that you have to come back for. i got some good stories for tonight. I think they're good stories anyway. But we need help, just, just like your church needs help, just like to bear, to get the word of God out. Your pastor mentioned 42 or 43 missionaries on the field. They're getting the word of God out in these countries, and sometimes they have to come up with unique ways to do it because of the country and the situation they're in. But they're, getting, they're bearing that load. They're carrying that load. There was a one-legged school teacher that came to Hudson Taylor, and he said, I want to offer myself for service to China. And Hudson Taylor said, well, with one leg, why would you consider going as a missionary? Got to make sure I get his name right. George Scott responded, and he said, because I don't see those with two legs going. Listen, we can make excuses all day about God's word. When you go back and you look at these placards, and I'm, I'm not getting into the history of it so much today, but when you go back and you look at these placards, and you see the sacrifices that were made for the Word of God. I could run between the East Coast and the, rest, the West Coast for the rest of my life every week and never make the sacrifices those men made. We could, we could take up an offering every single week at the church and, and give sacrificially to it, but never make the sacrifices that those men made so that we can have the Word of God. And as Pastor mentioned about the Word of God, we get into this discussion about the Word of God and we, and, we, and we say, well, it's just a book that man wrote. That makes zero sense. As Pastor mentioned, why would I, Pastor, let's, let's, let's write a book. And what I'm going to do is we're going to write every stupid thing that we've ever done and every sin that we've ever done. Let's write that book. What do you think about that? Listen, the truth of the matter is, like I heard the one old preacher say, if we all know the worst truths about each other, we would never talk to each other. Amen. We're a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners. And the only thing, the only great equalizer is at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, that we can know we're going to heaven. Not some religion. Man, I'm sure glad that the Baptists aren't the way to heaven. I've been in a lot of Baptist churches. There's some goofy Baptists out there. Some of you go, yeah, you're one of them. That's fine. But as we bear the precious seeds, we look at the word of God. Here's, here's something that always strikes me about the word of God being written by man. If the Bible were simply written by men, that history back there makes no sense. Many of those men were killed for their faith, burned at the stake. If it was simply a book that was written by men, why, why is it so popular still? Why is the number one produced book in the history of the world? And, and keep in mind, it's not a book, it's 66 books written over 1,500 years by 40 different men. There is no other book like that. When we, when we look at the Bible, we look at what God's done with the Bible, we look at, it's, it's a culturally relevant book in every culture throughout time. We just shipped a container load of scripture to Malawi, Africa. Because it's culturally relevant. They want it. We just shipped 107,000 New Testaments in Farsi to the Middle East. The people that are going to get those scriptures, if they're caught, will be beaten, will be tortured, and will be killed for that. It makes no sense if it's a man's book. It makes no sense if it's a man's book. It's a God-given book. And here's, here's the problem. Those that want to say, well, man just wrote it, is if they acknowledge that God wrote it, then they'd be duty-bound to read it and study it and meditate on it and obey the Word of God. So we have the Word of God, and, and as, we, as we look at the Word of God, it's important that we understand how precious it is. How precious it is. You understand that we are a small fraction of all mankind to ever hold God's word in our hands. There's 8 billion people alive today. Today, there's 8 billion people alive. 6 billion of them do not have a Bible or easy access to a Bible. I'm not saying they don't have it in their language. Some of them do and some of them don't. Malawi is a perfect case. You can give Bibles away all day in Malawi. They're just poverty stricken. I told you about the food situation. They, they can't afford a Bible. That's why we send them there for free. Six billion people today don't have a Bible. But then you think about before the printing press, you think about before the canon of Scripture, you think about we're a small fraction of all mankind to hold God's word in our hands. 
We have it. We're holding it. There's a, 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 I have a, in the front of my Bible a note that says, listen, if the Great Commission is true, our plans aren't, aren't too big, they're too small. It's only good news if it gets to them. We call the gospel the good news. It's not good news if it never reaches them. We have the Bible. It's so precious. Psalm 138, verse 2 says, I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for, thou, for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto the, them that put their trust in him. Luke 4, verse 4, it says, and I referenced this, this, this before, but it's saying, um, And Jesus answered him, saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. But by every word of God. We are to live our lives according to the scriptures. Now that's not easy. There's some things in the Bible that I'm not a big fan of, and I mean because they step on my toes. If I were to write this book, I'd probably, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough cover. All have sinned? I mean, everybody? I know some good people. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Right. My grandfather died last February, almost a year ago now. 101 years old. Wow, that's old. His mom lived to be 107, my great-grandma. 107. She raised 10 kids through the Great Depression. My great-grandpa, who I never met, decided that Great Depression's coming, I'm going to die. Um, he died at 40, 30, 38 or 40. Uh, Raised my grandpa and, and nine other siblings through the Great Depression. Wonderful lady, 107. My mom raised us for good in God. She got a job to help pay for us to go to Christian school and those kind of things. Served in our bus ministry for 30 years with my dad. Passed away at 60 years old. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. By the word of God. As we look at this last point, I'll be done quickly. If we look at the seed, I'm challenged with this thought. I read this to the young people in Romans chapter 10 this morning. It talks about how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. In Ezekiel, it says that if you don't warn the wicked of their wicked way, they're going to die in their transgression but the blood will be on their hand, on your hand. So my question for you is, do you have beautiful feet or do you have bloody hands? Do you have beautiful feet or do you have bloody hands? The last thing is the seed. That from which anything springs. First principle, original, and I, I mentioned this already, about the seed is the word of God. First Peter 1 and verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. John 6 and verse 63 says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The Bible is alive. You have to plant it in your life. Listen, I unapologetically use the King James, just like your pastor does, because God has supernaturally used it. Well, what about the these and the thous? And what about, do you realize that more people today will pick up their Bible and read from it? People say, well, you know, this Bible translation, they sold a few more of it. This one, this happened. More people will read from it, go to church, and follow it than any other translation in the history of mankind. Again, Take 10 minutes, take 15 minutes. If you're a slow reader like me, take 20 minutes and read through the history back there of how we got our Bible. I believe that God's going to hold us a different standard than most of mankind because we had the Bible in surplus and we decided not to read it. The other countries, the other people, they were, they were looking for a Bible to read and they could not read a Bible. We shun it. We have the precious Word of God, the seed that's planted. I'm going to say this from a farmer's standpoint. Let me say this from a farmer's standpoint. I told you I grew up in Amro. From my place to church is about eight miles I, w where we live presently. Before that was about eight miles as well, just a little different location. The road in front of our church, County Road E, which was to get into Oshkosh, becomes Witzel Avenue. That County Road E, that, that stretch, about six miles that we drive on that stretch. I have been on that stretch since I was eight years old, back and forth and back and forth. Conservatively, I put 300,000 miles on that stretch, going to Christian school, going to church, going to the print shop, going home, going to church, on there. Do you know what's between my house and the church? Fields. My wife and I counted up in the 14 years that we've bought our house in Amro, that we've lived there, three new houses have gone up. Everything else is fields. And I love to watch them plant corn. I love it. 
I love it when they get out there and they, and they work the fields and that, that rich black dirt soil gets turned up, got a little bit of sand, a little bit of clay in it, and they mix that up, they, they till it up, they plant the corn, and then you see that corn just start to poke up. I love to see that. And then there's some days in July where I go into work and, it, and maybe it was raining when I went in or rained the night before and the sun comes out and it feels like that corn has just grown tremendously. And I love that. And then, of course, harvest time. And I love when the farmers have a good harvest. We had a really good harvest this year in Round Rock. It was, everything went very well. It looked like a, a great yield. And I love to see that. But I've been doing this now for, for 30, 38 years, I guess. Back and forth, back and forth. You know what I've never done in all those years? I've never pulled my car to the side of the road and sat down in the ditch. And the farmer comes up to me and goes, what, what are you doing? I, I love to watch corn grow. <laughs> okay, can you, can you move on? But you know, we do that in our Christian life. We read our Bible one time and we don't see any change. But somebody new comes to church and they're struggling with some addictions, they're struggling with some things and there's some stuff going on. And we say, well, they were in church last Sunday, why, why don't they... Why don't they have it right this Sunday? Because growth takes time. The Word of God's alive. Plant that seed in your life and watch it grow. Watch it grow. Here's, here's a suggestion. Maybe you're new to church. I'm going to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, just like the preacher from Wisconsin did. No, 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 no. I didn't have a choice. I had parents that weren't afraid of discipline. I had parents that weren't afraid of... We had a rule in our house. I tell my boys... You don't have to obey the rules in our house. You can move out anytime you want. None of them have ever taken me up on that offer, by the way. They like food, apparently. But here's, here's where you start. Maybe you're not real faithful to church on Sunday morning. Make it a goal to be faithful to church on Sunday morning. Sunday night will come. Don't worry. Be faithful to church on Sunday morning. Hey, I, I, man, I want to read my Bible. I want to study. It, it's a thick book. Let me tell you, it's a thick book. Pastor, the more I study my Bible, the less I know about it. It's a thick book. You think I graduated from Bible college, I've been preaching all these years. You think I got it figured out. I don't. But here's what happens. People get discouraged. I'm going to read the Bible. So I'm going to start in Genesis, and I'm going to read it three hours every day. Can I suggest maybe starting in a New Testament book? Can I suggest maybe just reading a handful of minutes every day? Can I suggest getting in a habit of planting the seed? Do you, know, do you know when I talked about the corn and we had a good crop this year? Do you know what would have been a really bad thing for our crops this year? No water. Just all sunlight all the time. Do you know what else would have been really bad for our crops this year? If it would just rain the whole time, we would have washed it out. When you plant the seed of God's word in your life, it will grow. It Will, it has to grow because God promised it will. Now, maybe it doesn't grow the way you want it to because you're not God. Maybe it doesn't grow as fast as you want it to or it doesn't take as many promise because the Bible says that we wrestle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our flesh is terrible. Maybe we get saved. Maybe we get, kind of get Satan boxed out a little bit there. But the flesh just keeps coming back. The flesh keeps coming back. I honestly, I mean, I, I keep looking at my watch and I, I see the clock back there, but I don't really know what time it is. I'm in Indiana, they're on a different time. I'm Wisconsin, that's a different time, and now I'm here. My flesh, at some point today, is going to say, it's time to go to sleep. It might be in the next hour. It might not be till 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't even know at this point. But we have the scriptures. I am so thankful for those that made the sacrifice. When I asked you at the beginning of this, what are you doing for God? I, I don't know what God has for your life. You know, we're talking about an offering. That's obviously finances. And I'm so thankful for the people that God uses financially in our ministry. We need those things to keep the lights on, to buy the paper, and to produce those things. I'm so thankful for those that pray. Please never forget that your missionaries need prayer. There's a reason we send our pictures out. There's a reason we, we have, we have these, uh, this information about what's going on. We need prayer. You sometimes don't understand what's going on in some of these corn fields how difficult some of those things are, but pray for them. What I think equally important is that we don't come back to a church 
that's taken a step backwards. Now, I, I don't live in Malawi, but if I were and I were to come back to your church in four years from now, and you guys have said, well, yeah, the Bible's a pretty good book, and yeah, the King James is an all right translation, yeah, that'd be so discouraging to me. There's a saying, the light that shines the furthest shines the brightest at home. And the way your church is going to shine the brightest here, the way your church is going to affect your area, your state, your country, and the world is by each and every one of you finding out what God wants for you to do. I started as a 13-year-old young man. I am where I am today because of a good church, a good school, parents that loved me, they weren't afraid to raise me right, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Hoffman that was willing to take a chance with me and, and help me grow into the ministry. I don't stand here on my own. I don't stand here on my own at all. It's all because of God's grace and his mercy. God wants to use you. Don't resist what God has for you. Study his word. He'll show you. Be thankful for his word. We're just, I can't get past that word precious, how precious, precious, precious God's word is to us. Know your Bible. Listen, your pastor has went out of his way to set these these displays up in the back so you can know that your Bible didn't just appear in 1611. It's a long history of how we got to it. So thankful. I'm going to pray, Pastor, and I'll, I'll turn the service over to you. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your word. Lord, we, we, we focused on your word today. We're, we're studying your word today. God, it, it is so precious to us. Lord, the, the old-time saints understood how precious God's word. Sometimes we look at some of the old-time saints that maybe they weren't highly educated, but they understood your word. They understood how important it was. They understood how important it was to have in their lives, in their family's life, their church, their community. And Lord, I pray that we'd get back to that, that we'd have a holy reverence towards your word. Lord, maybe there's somebody here today that they've never accepted Christ as their Savior. Lord, I don't know their hearts. Lord, I heard sermons hundreds upon hundreds of times before I got saved. And God, help them to understand that this is not about a religion. It's not about joining this church. It's not about giving money. It's not about any of those things. It's about that personal relationship with you. God, you're a giver. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, you've given us Jesus. Help us to be willing to give up our sin. Help us to be willing to realize that we're in need of a Savior. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the lighthouse they are here in this community. We pray that you guide us and direct us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us stand together. Let us stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed. We're going to sing a song in just a moment. That song is number 163. As the pastor is, has preached, the minister who God has sent at this point He's reached, what have I done for God? And the reality is, you can't do anything until you're saved. And the reality is, the most important thing that you do need in your life is salvation through Jesus Christ. There'll never be a more important thing in your life than that. And if you're not sure, uh, this is the day to get your questions answered. I'm going to be standing right in the middle, right in the front. Now, there may be others of you, and you want to come to an old-fashioned altar, and you want to pray and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You haven't figured it out. You know God wants you to do something, but you don't know what it is. Now's the time to either make a decision to do what you know God wants you to do or to ask him what he would have you to do. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word in our hearts. Help us as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. The song is 163. And as we sing this song, it's simply a song of trust. Say, who I trust only trust him. He will save you and can save you. But this is your opportunity as an invitation is always to make a choice. You come while we sing this song together. He will save you now. So let's sing this song together.
maybe there's a place here for you. There's a decision that you know that God wants you to make. Yet what would stop you from making it now? Accept your own two feet and just walking forward and taking a step for him. There is a God who loves you that has the best plan for you, better than any plan that you could come up with or even I could come up with. And he wants you to be on that path and on that course right now. Would you come some 